For the next session, we would like to welcome Drs. Timothy Allen, Zara Malecki, Mohammed Mohammed, and David Feller Kopman to discuss biomarker testing methodology and recommendations. Good morning again, and uh, welcome to session two. This should be a lot of fun. Uh, could I have the first slide, please? Can you go? Yeah, well, here we are. Uh, yeah, my, my few minutes here is going to be an overview of immunohistochemistry. chemistry. Those of you who live in the laboratory with me, this will be pretty basic, but those of you who don't spend your days in the laboratory, I want you to understand, let's pull back the paraffin curtain a little bit and show you what uh, some of the details are in, in doing this and, and with some particularity to uh, out testing as well. Uh, so let's talk about IHCs. Uh, Immunohistochemistry uh, is, is a type of, of glass slide we look at in which the tissue is stained differently from the typical HD slide. Uh, IHC involves antibodies. And of course, fixation is always important if the tissue is underfixed or overfixed. Uh, havoc can, can occur and misdiagnoses and, uh, can occur. Uh, you can actually occasionally do IHC on frozen tissue. It's not a practical thing, uh, maybe research, but for the most part, anything we're gonna do on a large basis needs to be formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. Uh, so please keep that in mind. And, you know, I mentioned this morning, pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical issues. Uh, again, there's no, there's no magic. Those have to be a, a, a addressed for successful IHC. Uh, you know, we're talking about lung cancer here, our non-small cell lung cancer patients. Uh, Immunohistochemistry is used uh, not only for, uh, very importantly, for diagnosis of the specific uh, uh, type of lung cancer, uh, in many cases, not all, but in many, uh, but it's, it's vital for, at the moment, it's vital for our biomarker testing. It's been well established and is, and in fact, is a very powerful way of doing it. Uh, take home message on this slide for the pathologist point of view and the laboratory point of view, it's readily available, relatively easy to perform, fairly easy for us to look at and assess. We can get quick results with meaningful clinical information and it doesn't break the bank on the most part. So it kind of checks a lot of boxes there, which is why in our world of next-gen sequencing, it has, it's a still robust method. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, I talked about pre and post and, and other analytical variables. Uh, so let's jump right in. What are the pre-analytical variables for immunohistochemical staining at writ large? Uh, it starts the, the moment, not the second even, but the moment the tissue is removed from the patient, oxygenation to that tissue is gone. Uh, so now we have to do a fixation. Uh, is fixation delayed? Is it fixed in the wrong material uh, or solution? It, is is uh, the tissue embedded in paraffin correctly? These are pre-analytic variables. This is what's done before the testing with the immunohistochemical uh, antibody. The cold ischemia time, that's the time from the tissue taken out of the body to the time of being put in formin. Should be less than an hour. I think as we do more research, it may actually even shrink, but for the moment we say an hour and it has to be fixed appropriately. You, you know, I'm a pathologist, I've been around the block. You can't just grease the container with formalin so the tissue will slip into it, uh, which I've seen. You've got to have about 10 times the specimen volume in 10% uh, uh, formalin for appropriate fixation. And I know that we want fast diagnoses, but in fact, fixation time for, for, for biopsy should be up to 24 hours. And for resection specimens, maybe up to three days, depending upon the situation. We often don't have to do that, but uh, inappropriate fixation or lack of fixation time can cause real diagnostic problems and staining problems. Uh, now, analytic variables. The laboratory's responsibility is the analytic variables. So are we developing adequate antibodies? Are antigen retrieval. Uh, what is the concentration of this antibody? What are incubation time, incubation temperature, signal enhancement, uh, epitope retrieval buffers? All these unknown words you're hearing are the detail that the laboratory team has to go through to make sure to ensure that we have a good antibody and a good antibody test with IHC. And of course, we then have to validate this. That is to show that it's going to work for our patients once we develop a test. And uh, at least 10 samples need to be tested to make sure they're all uh, testing as, as they should be. And that can be tough. Uh, you know, out positivity is not uncommon. It's not rare, but it's not every day. And so coming up with 10 samples in order to test for a, a IHC test can sometimes be a, a problematic. Next slide. 
And then after the test is done, what are the post analytic variables? That kind of falls on the pathologist's shoulders. You know, we have to evaluate the slide. What about the controls? Do we have appropriate controls for this test? Uh, and of course, there's an element of subjectivity in all of these uh, uh, tests we look at. Uh, and we can reduce this by using a scoring system. There are publications on that that can really help with understanding the positivity of immune chemical stains. Uh, and as in any other situation, pathologists have to be careful to, to look for staining artifact, background change, crush, crush artifact can, can uh, draw in the stain, uh, purification or necrosis. Uh, these things have to be taken into account uh, when evaluating the slide. Next slide, please. So what specifically can I say about ALK IHC? Uh, I guess I'll start with this. ALK was originally started uh, as a test on, with, using fish. Uh, and so IHC was tested uh, and, uh, and now we actually use IHC as an appropriate assay and we use fish testing to confirm with intermediate or weak uh, staining uh, IHC results. Um, and there are again, out specific pre-analytic variables. The D5F3 and uh, 5A4 antibodies have shown good uh, sensitivity and I think they're good. The ALK1 antibody is less accurate and I, I don't think it should be used. I think that's, that, that mm -hmm. has to be a pretty uh, standard now that's not being used much. Uh, and there are also ALK specific post-analytic variables. Because ALK protein is not expressed in uh, mature lung tissue in a normal manner, you're not gonna have a so-called positive control. There's not a, a normal cell to see staining as you might see in others. So when you see the strong IHC amplification, uh, it is, this is a marker of tumor positivity with ALK. But again, that's why artifacts have to be considered because you can even see strong uh, artifactual staining uh, and perhaps give a false positive result. So it takes some attention and some uh, experience. Next slide, please. Uh, and there are additional post analytic variables. Uh, these these uh, stains are very granular in the cytoplasm of the tumor cell, uh, but you can see granular staining in the alveolar macrophages, uh, sometimes nerve cells. Uh, and by the way, nerve or ganglion cells in tumors can stain. That can be difficult to discern. Uh, sometimes glandular epithelium. Mucin, of course, likes to attract everything, and necrosis, everything's broken down and stain will be there. Uh, especially mucin containing cells, so called signet ring cells, named because the mucin is so abundant it pushes the cytoplasm and the nucleus to the side. Uh, these have to be carefully looked at because one can see uh, out positivity in a thin uh, membrane of the uh, cytoplasm, and the mucin itself, which takes up most of the cell, uh, doesn't show any staining. So it does take uh, some experienced eye uh, to, to make sure you don't overcall or undercall in these situations. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned, fish is used confirmatorily in indeterminate cases, but you know, the history is important because ALK was originally used uh, uh, with fish only. Uh, I think the oncology community kind of got suspicious. Tests were done, trials were done that really didn't show much in terms of IHC, but that was probably due to the, the biomarkers that were being tested. So please don't use this evidence against the appropriate use of IHC biomarkers today for testing for ALK. Uh, it's important to understand that the uh, uh, IHC uh, use and the chemistry around it can influence test outcome. And so please support your laboratory team uh, by making sure that the pre-analytic issues such as fixation and things are 100%. Uh, and remember, we can use this to our patient's advantage. In fact, Alcus chemistry is so good now that in fact, some places are just not even requiring fish confirmation because they're much more experienced with it. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll leave us uh, with a few questions we can consider perhaps later. So is, is next gen sequencing gonna replace IHC and fish? Well, and we can talk about that. Uh, I think as has been alluded to next gen sequencing is really emerging quickly as a sort of a so-called one-stop solution to lung cancer diagnostics. Hopefully it'll be more timely, et cetera, and it, it uses less tissue perhaps, but because ALK is affordable, it's sensitive, we're used to it, it's available. Uh, it really is not, a, 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 I think, uh, cannot be 
considered it next gen sequencing as any sort of replacement for elk IHC. Uh, and I think there'll be a balance there for some time to come. In fact, perhaps next gen sequencing might replace fish as a confirmatory uh, uh, test in the future, but we'll see. Next slide. Thank you very much. We continue our uh, discussion. Oh, sorry. Let's just say so one more time. I'm sorry. One, two, three. We continue our discussion about advances in non small cell lung cancer or reviewing cytogenetics and also methodology applied for uh, detection of um, driver mutations. Next slide, please. Here it shows my. Um, uh, Twitter um, account uh, information. Next slide, please. So the goal of uh, pathologic evaluation of material is to first render a, an accurate diagnosis using 2015 WHO classification and also to preserve tissue for molecular studies. That's extremely important when it comes to uh, pathology. Next slide, please. So uh, the goal of um, detection of molecular alterations in non-small cell lung cancer is to find those genetic alterations with impact on therapy. And second would be avoidance of therapies with no or minimal clinical benefit. Next slide, please. So WHO has a um, few guidelines regarding how to diagnose uh, small cell carcinoma versus non-small cell carcinoma that Dr. Allen um, uh, went through the discussion beautifully. Now we are talking about also other guidelines, including like NCCN guidelines when it comes to um, non-small cell uh, lung carcinomas. Uh, based on NCCN guidelines, they are um, categorized into small cell carcinoma versus adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and also non-small cell carcinoma not otherwise specified. And each one of these come with different recommendations in terms of um, molecular therapy and also those driver mutations. Next slide, please. This uh, slide simply shows different driver mutations with associated treatments available for those. And as you see here, for all of them, it says um, first line therapy. In addition to those uh, molecular alterations in non-small cell lung carcinoma, you also see some uh, immune therapy uh, associated with uh, PDL1 and PD1. Next slide, please. So there are different type of uh, mutations uh, in non-small cell lung carcinoma, and the treatments are based on detection of those, including um, ALK rearrangement, EGFR, which is extremely important. Uh, for uh, PDL1 treatment, it goes also with a scoring that we are going to talk about it more uh, in next um, slides. But what we should keep in mind that in general, when it comes to molecular alterations, only a small subset of non-small cell carcinomas harbor those mutations. For example, if you look at the diagram on the right side, you see only 1% of lung cancer patients harbor ROS1 mutation. And that's also true about NRAS and also ACT1. While EGFR mutation is probably the most common type of molecular alteration seen in 10 to 35% of the patients. Next slide, please. So when it comes to molecular studies, there, uh, it's important to keep in mind that upfront slide sectioning is extremely important when tissue is um, limited. There are different methods of detection of uh, molecular alterations, including next generation sequencing, which is a broad-based panel 
Uh, next one we can uh, mention RNA-based NGS, which is actually maximized detection of fusion events, especially when it comes to never smoker patients. PCR uh, also is utilized for a specific targeted fusions, and of course, um, fluorescent in situ hybridization is a method to examine uh, copy numbers, amplifications, or structural alterations in non-small cell lung carcinoma. Next slide, please. So let's talk about FISH. FISH is a method, a molecular cytogenetic technique to locate and also detect a specific DNA sequence on a chromosome using a probe. What is probe anyway? Probe is a small piece of DNA or RNA sequence with an attached fluorescent molecule. And binding occurs between a probe and part of DNA with high degree of complementarity. Next slide, please. So there are several important processes when it comes to fish. One would be the um, denaturing the chromosome. Second would be the denaturing the probe. Third step would be hybridization. Fourth would be fluorescent staining. And at last, detection of those uh, um, areas uh, in the dark. Next slide, please. So what are the advantages when it comes to fish? It's highly sensitive. It's very specific with rapid, rapid turnaround time. Is highly specific and also effective when it comes to detection of those uh, structural um, changes. The turnaround time is around four to 24 hours. And each time uh, we would be able to analyze a thousand to 2000 cells in only 15 to 45 minutes. On the other hand, there are some disadvantages, including high cost of fluorescence microscope, and also loss of signals with time in fish slides. Next slide, please. So when it, in terms of uh, materials that can be used for um, fish, there are a variety of uh, specimens that can be used, uh, including formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, that can be cell blocks, can be histology material, small core biopsies. We can use the smears, including unstained, Papanicola stain, Romanovsky stains, and also cytospin. Touching prints can also be used, and also, also liquid-based preparations. Next slide, please. So there are different types of probes available when it comes to fish. Um, for example, um, ALK um, translocation, that is one of the probes that is basically ALK translocation is seen in um, never smokers most commonly uh, in 2 to 7% of the cases. Um, when it comes to BRAF, it's a point mutation in 5% of um, cases. Among uh, fish probes, we can also mention KRAS which are on exon two and three, mostly in smoker patients. And um, we can also mention of ROS in 1% of non-small cell lung cancer, which is mostly seen in never smoker patients. Next slide, please. So in our institutions, there are four uh, rearrangements um, studied by FISH, including ALK, um, ROS1 on chromosome 6, RET rearrangement on chromosome 10, and also MET amplification. Next slide, please. So here is an example of um, ALK rearrangement. Uh, basically, uh, that's a tyrosine kinase receptor, and this rearrangement can be associated with responsiveness to oral ALK TKI therapy. EML4 is the most common fusion partner, and there are different methods of detection of ALK in non-small cell lung cancer, including FISH, NGS, 
target um, targeted real time PCR. And interestingly, and more importantly, is that recently FDA has approved IHC for uh, ALK, and that can be utilized as a standalone test. So that doesn't require any confirmation by fish. Next slide, please. So here is an example of ALK rearrangement that is uh, using um, uh, breakpoint probe, which is actually, we have inversion of EML4 ALK fusion. And uh, that break apart probe um, is actually, as you see here, um, it can um, show responsiveness to treatments with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Generally speaking, we can talk about crizetonib as a, a targeting ALK positive non-small cell uh, lung cancer. Next slide, please. ROS1 is another um, driver mutation. It's also a tyrosine kinase receptor. And the common fusion partners when it comes to um, ROS1 which are associated with responsiveness to oral ROS1 TKI therapy. There are different methods of detection of ROS1 um, alterations, including FISH, NGS, and targeted real-time PCR. We should keep in mind that IHC is not a superior method for um, detection of ROS1 fusion. It uh, carries low specificity, and it needs to be confirmed furthermore by other methods such as FISH. Next slide, please. So when it comes to RED, is a receptor tyrosine kinase. Uh, it causes um, dysregulation and inappropriate signaling through the RED kinase domain. Uh, there are common fusions, including KIF5B, uh, among others. And this patient can be responsive to oral red TKI uh, therapy, regardless of uh, fusion partners. Um, NGS-based methodology also highly specific for uh, detection of red. And uh, RNA-based, however, is preferable to DNA-based for fusion detection in general. We should keep in mind that fish in general may underdetect detect um, uh, red fusions. Next slide, please. MET is another driver mutation. It's mostly uh, located at exon 14. Skipping variants is also a receptor tyrosine kinase. And loss of MET on exon 14 leads also to dysregulation and this patient can be responsive to oral med TKI therapy. NGS, RNA-based NGS demonstrating um, improvement in detection. So um, in general, NGS can be used. However, RNA-based NGS shows uh, superiority in terms of detection of these uh, um, molecular alterations. Next slide, please. This is an example of fish test for MET amplification. Uh, next slide, please. BRAF is another mutation, which is actually a point mutation. Uh, BRAF belongs to a family of serotonin kinase, and it's involved in MAP ERK signaling pathway. Uh, the change of um, amino acid position V600E uh, would cause BRAF, would show as BRAF mutation. Uh, there are different type of uh, morphologies associated with BRAF mutated uh, carcinomas. And combined therapy with oral inhibitors of BRAF and make um, show um, some um, responses in patients with uh, BRAF mutations. There are different methods of detection of BRAF, real-time PCR, Sanger sequencing, and also NGS. Next slide, please. 
EGFR is probably the most important driver mutation that needs to be evaluated in any patients. EGFR is a receptor tyrosine kinase on the surface of epithelial cells. Um, they are located mostly on exon 19 and exon 21. When it comes to exon 19, it's the lesion, and on exon 21 is point mutation on PL858R, and these patients can be responsive to oral EGFR uh, TKI therapy. That's extremely important when it comes to patients with uh, advanced stages, stage 2A, 3, um, 2B, 3A, or high-risk stage 1B to 2A. When a patient shows some uh, resistance to first and second generation of TK, EGFR TKI therapy, that's the time that we should think about resistance to those uh, treatments and that's the time that those patients should be tested for EGFRP T790M. There is another subset of EGFR alterations um, which are located on exon 20. They are, they are a diverse group of in-frame duplication or insertion mutations. There is some clinical significance when it comes to this um, um, exon 20 alterations, uh, including they can be, uh, the, um, patients might have lack of response to EGFR TKI therapy when they are associated with um, some of those um, changes on exon 20. So the exon 20 is important. Because of that, a specific sequence of EGFR exon 20 insertion mutations are important to be investigated. And there are different methodologies, including real-time PCR, Sanker sequencing. NGS is probably the most common methodology deployed for examining EGFR status. Next slide, please. KRAS is another point mutation. KRAS is a G protein with intrinsic GTPase activity. Um, activating mutation results in unregulated signaling through the MAP ERK pathway, as you see a cartoon of that on the right side of the slide. KRAS are most commonly seen at codon 12, and they are also associated with poor survival in a patient. So they actually show some prognostic factors in terms of uh, survival in non-small cell lung cancer patients. Moreover, they also are associated with reduced responsiveness to EGFR TKI therapy. So presence of a non-activating mutation in KRAS identifies those patients who are unlikely to benefit from further molecular testing. Next slide, please. NTRK123 um, also are part of driver mutations. Those are also tyrosine kinase receptors. They are rarely rearranged in non-small cell lung cancer. And those point mutations are generally non-activating and haven't been investigated in associated with targeted therapy so far. There are different methods of detection, including FISH, IHC, PCR, and NGS. Again, DNA-based NGS may underdetect NTRK1 and NTRK3 fusions. Next slide, please. Now let's move on to some of those um, immune therapies. First, we start with PDL1 or program um, dead ligand 1. PDL1 is a co regulatory molecule that is expressed on tumor cells, on non -small, including non small cell lung carcinomas, and inhibiting T cell mediated cell death. On the other hand, there is PD1. A negative regulator binds to ligands, including PDL1 or PDL2, and PDL1 
is a tumor suppressor for T cell activity. So from one side, we have PDL1, a receptor on tumor cells. From the other side, we have PD1 on T cells. So immune checkpoint inhibitors block that PDL1 and PD1 interaction and enhance anti tumor effect of T cells. IHC is used for detection of PDL1, and PDL1 now is considered as first line therapy in these patients. Next slide, please. It's very important to keep in mind that IHC for PDL1 is FDA approved, and this IHC, the interpretation is based on the membranous expression of tumor cells. And these patients can benefit of pembrolizumab uh, when they show membranous expression of PDL1. PDL1 is reported based on um, tumor proportion um, score and based on the percentage of tumor cells expressing PDL1. On the right side, you um, show, uh, you see um, six different slides with um, uh, stand for PDL1. Starts with um, slide A showing basically just a negative control, no expression. Slide F shows 100% membranous expression, and between just shows um, variable degrees of PDL1 expression. Next slide, please. So when it comes to PDL1, that basically is based on definition of positive or negative testing. It depends on uh, the, that can be variable based on antibody and also the platform deployed. So in non-small cell cancer patients harboring tumors with oncogenic driver and also PDL1 expression targeted therapy for oncogenic driver should be considered first. However, we see a lot of clinicians actually ask for um, those um, molecular alterations in the tumor and PDL1, uh, sometimes even like simultaneously. Next slide, please. So here is the cartoon on the right side showing um, PDL1 on tumor cells, PD1 located as a receptor on T cells, and also showing anti PDL1 and anti PD1, how they interact with those receptors to improve actually uh, tumor cell death by T cells. In, based on NCCN guidelines, PDL1 um, expression can be categorized to less than 1%. 1 to 49 percent and equal to or greater than 50 percent of the cells. Next slide, please. We should keep in mind that also um, the College of American of Pathologists um, has recommendation when it comes to molecular studies. The CAP recommends at least a panel of EGFR ALK and ROS1 as a first panel when there is so limited material for um, molecular studies. And the expanded or second panel would include BRAF, MET, RET, ERBB2, and also KRAS when there is adequate material. The other new recommendation of College of American Pathologists is that we should not report EGFR copy number analysis, and we should not use FISH or CISH or any other methodologies when it comes to the detection of EGFR. Next slide, please. NCCN also has um, guidelines for adenocarcinomas, large cell carcinomas, and non-small cell lung cancer otherwise as specifies when it comes to category one, is also EGFR, ALK, and PDL1 testing. Those are considered as 
category one. In addition, ROS1, BRAF, NTRK123, Metexon14 skipping and RET. For squamous cell carcinoma, the only testing that is in category one based on NCCN guideline is actually PDL1 testing. And if there is additional material, then there is EGFR mutation, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, Metexon14 skipping, RET, and also NTRK123. Next slide, please. So there has been there have been some changes in uh, recommended 2019 I'm, I'm sorry 2018 CAP recommendations. One of them that is extremely important when it comes to cytology and cytology material is that now CAP recognizes any cytology sample with adequate cellularity and preservation acceptable for molecular testing, uh, which is originally that, that that recommendation was only preferred for cell blocks over smears. And also analytic methods must be able to detect mutation in a sample with 20% or more um, malignant cell content. Also, um, CAP emphasizes that IHC is not an appropriate method for detection of um, EGFR testing. And ROS1 testing should be performed on all lung adenocarcinoma patients irrespective of clinical characteristics. And again, when it comes to molecular testing, especially when it comes to limited material, it comes with category one, which is a must test category EGFR, ALK, and ROS1, and then expanded, you know, category, which actually would be like, you know, category two. Next slide, please. So there is a strong recommendation that physicians must use EGFR and ALK molecular testing for lung adenocarcinoma patients at the time of diagnosis uh, when these patients are presented with advanced stage disease, or there is a progression uh, um, in patients with lower stage of the disease, but they not uh, been tested previously for EGFR or ALK1. And also pathologists can utilize cell blocks or any type of cytologic preparations for uh, detection of lung cancer biomarkers. Again, another emphasis that not only we cannot use IHC for EGFR, but also we are strongly discouraged to use any type of EGFR co copy number analysis, such as FISH uh, or um, SISH. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned before, the um, expanded pattern um, category would be um, including RET, BRAF, ERBB2, KRAS, and MET. And those are not currently indicated as a routine standalone assay outside the context of a clinical trial. And it's appropriate to include RET as part of larger testing panels performed either initially or routinely with EGFR, ALK, and ROS1, when they are actually negative. Next slide, please. So ROS1, IHC may be used as a screening in advanced stage lung adenocarcinoma. However, ROS1, IHC should be confirmed by a molecular or cytogenetic method. So we cannot use it as a standalone test. However, when it comes to ALK, as I stated before, uh, IHC is an equivalent alternative to FISH for ALK. So if a lab has access to uh, IHC for ALK, um, that's um, uh, sufficient. Uh, again, when it comes to EGFR in patients who develop progression of the disease, 
um, and not responding to um, category one and category two EGFR TKI therapy to in those patients definitely EGFR T790M should be investigated to make sure that if these patients have developed any type of resistance. In those scenarios, even 5% of viable tumor cells should be adequate. Next slide, please. So what is the role of uh, free DNA, cell-free DNA when it comes to detection of uh, those molecular alterations in lung cancer? At this time, the recommendation of College of American Pathologies is that there is insufficient evidence to support the use of those circulating cell-free plasma DNA molecular methods for diagnosis of primary lung adenocarcinoma. However, in some clinical settings, when the specimen is extremely limited or there is insufficient material for molecular testing, physicians may use those cell-free plasma DNA assay to identify EGFR mutations. And also cell-free plasma DNA methods can be utilized to identify EGFR T790M mutation in lung adenocarcinoma patients with progression of the disease. Next slide, please. So when it comes to different type of mutations, our understanding is that um, presence of EGFR mutation can be associated with the smoking status, ethnicity, or histology type of um, car carcinomas. Also, artery arrangement has shown some association with the smoking status of the patients hist and histology. However, these factors should not be considered in selecting patients for testing, and that's part of CAP recommendation. Next slide, please. So what is on the horizon? There are different probes coming to, uh, for um, detection of some mutations, including, for example, tuberosis sclerosis 1 or tuberosis sclerosis 2. Next slide, please. So at this point, I uh, conclude my talk. And thank you so much for uh, your attention. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Um, actually, after uh, the two wonderful pathologists uh, have their presentation, I'm, I really don't have much really to offer here as a medical oncologist. Uh, they really covered most of these in a very uh, nice way. I uh, just need to remind you, I have only two slides here uh, based on the NCCN guidelines. Uh, so just a reminder that, you know, definitely as a medical oncologist, uh, I would always prefer to go with the uh, NGS assay because it's going to give me multiple mutations in one test and also save the tissue um, uh, in, in a better way rather than do sequential uh, or um, a few tests at a time. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, PCR and uh, you know, it's as looking just for one specific mutation may not be appropriate when we treat uh, lung cancer patient uh, at this point. Uh, so um, also uh, we're gonna cover uh, liquid biopsy in, in a second. Uh, so preference for medical oncologists who really treat lung cancer, we like to give a, uh, we like to get a full uh, assay uh, for uh, our patient with multiple mutations, whether we have an actionable treatment for them at this point or not. Uh, it's uh, the signs keep changing and we, we discover uh, new treatment for different mutations. So it's always to have uh, these multiple mutations available for us, even if they are not actionable at the point, at this point, they may be actionable in the, in the future. And as we see uh, now we having uh, KRS, um, uh, you know, mutation drugs that uh, will become hopefully available very soon. 
In the past, we didn't care about KRS. Now I really need to know what the KRS status is. Um, so just from a medical oncology uh, side, I need a full panel. I just don't want a single mutation um, uh, to be reported to me. Uh, the fish uh, definitely is uh, important in certain situations like the elk, like the Ross. And uh, Dr. Maleki and Dr. Allen actually covered that very, very nicely uh, for, for our patient. Uh, definitely testing also for PDL1 expression is important for patients who don't have mutation. Uh, so again, it's tissue is the issue. So uh, we really want to do a lot of testing, but we have very limited amount. And sometimes you have to send it to multiple areas or multiple labs to do the testing. And we, we have limited amount. So we really need when we send to one lab that we get all what we uh, like to have. Next slide, please. So um, I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, plasma cell free circulating uh, tumor DNA. And that's really um, getting very popular these days. And uh, many of us are dependent on it. The NCCM guideline um, doesn't really give a lot of recommendation uh, regarding the liquid at this point, even among uh, thoracic oncologists, we have uh, been heavily using liquid uh, biopsy at this point, even sometimes before the tissue. Uh, definitely we need the tissue to, uh, to have the histology and to know uh, uh, what we're dealing with first. And uh, the problem with sending the tissue for the next generation sequence is take up to three weeks sometimes to get the results. Uh, the blood test could take up to seven days, but there are limitations to each one of them. Uh, I think each one of them, the tissue and the, uh, the liquid biopsy can miss around 15% of the patient. Uh, so uh, there is a trend now, and I'm actually start applying this way, is to send both of them at the same time. And whoever, whatever test comes first, if it comes positive, um, most of the time I can cancel the second one. Sometimes I just let it uh, go just for confirmation. Uh, but a positive test, whether it's coming by tissue or coming by liquid, is sufficient for me to start treatment. A negative test, I would probably wait for the next one to come uh, to confirm. Uh, there are limitations on uh, liquid biopsy with ALK, and I'm going to present a case later on, uh, that uh, sometimes if there is not enough shedding and enough uh, uh, molecules in the circulation, uh, ALK specific, uh, specifically can be missed on the liquid biopsy. Um, so that also uh, will be a limitation. There is a almost a 85%, close to 90% concordance between the tissue and the uh, liquid. So they are, the liquid is not really very inferior. Uh, they, they are really, uh, the concordance between the two are very high at this point. I need to remind everyone here also that we need to have the molecular study before starting the patient on treatment. There are significant toxicity, uh, especially if we start immune therapy first, uh, followed by uh, target therapy. Uh, pneumonitis is high, especially in the EGFR mutation uh, group. Uh, also, immune therapy doesn't work great. Uh, there are a lot of patients that would come with a combination of high PDL1 expression and also. Uh, mutation. Uh, these patients, they don't respond well, the patient with mutation, they don't respond well to immune therapy. Um, actually, their response rate is always less than 10% uh, with immune therapy compared to 50, 60, sometimes 80% with the uh, target therapy. So this is just uh, some of the uh, NCCN guideline regarding uh, free liquid biopsy. Um, even the studies that we have available uh, are more supportive of using liquid biopsy at this, uh, at this time. I think this is my uh, last slide for this section, at least. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, we will now be opening for panel discussions. If the panelists can unmute, 
Uh, um, uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, the uh, insurance issues surrounding molecular testing. As we know, many of the targeted therapies uh, targeting these uh, biomarkers are indicated mostly in the metastatic or advanced inoperable setting, but testing could uh, be very variable in terms of when it's being performed. So some institutions have opted to uh, test at time of diagnosis, others wait until they are ready to start treatment, and both uh, approaches have uh, advantages and disadvantages. And I'm just wondering uh, how insurance carriers have uh, been reimbursing tests that are ordered up front and what your experience is with that. I, I can take it from the medical oncology side. Uh, now, since we have uh, indication for uh, target therapy for early stage disease, uh, especially for EGFR mutation positive patient after resection, uh, so that now it's covered um, for this patient. And that's, uh, that's probably would be the only, uh, I mean, the first one, because I'm expecting more to come. Uh, if uh, EGFR mutation uh, has approval now with ozimretinib on the front line for a stage 1B and higher after resection. So that test is going to be covered because it's required. Uh, and I'm expecting that we'll see something similar to ALK, something similar to ROS or RIT, whatever, uh, hopefully in the future. Um, I have not seen any pushback uh, recently for testing early stage. We used to uh, uh, test stage three and, and four in the past, but now with the early stage requiring testing, I have not uh, seen uh, any pushback about uh, billing for, for this group. Uh, actually, it's also very interesting that the blood test and the tissue test have different codes. So sometimes when you try to do them concurrently, you can because it will not go under the same code. Um, so uh, it's doable if needed. From, from my perspective, I think there are different perspectives. From my perspective, I, I think that we're still in a growing stage for payment. Um, I've seen different outcomes with early stage testing. Plus, if, if one wants to do next-gen sequencing uh, with an earlier stage, uh, getting paid is more difficult. Uh, again, again, being at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, uh, our payer mix is such that payment is often a, a, a problematic. Uh, my hats off to folks for which uh, payment works real well. Uh, that's great. I think, though, that uh, a lot of us still struggle with uh, payment for these tests. But I think it will evolve as, uh, again, as we start seeing more reason for earlier stage testing. Uh, we're going to have to come to some sort of, a, of an agreement that testing will occur. And next-gen sequencing is probably going to decrease in cost uh, a little bit more as time goes on. So I'm, I'm optimistic, but I do think that we still have to keep our, our eye on that ball uh, for some of us anyway. We also have on this panel a pulmonologist, Dr. Uh, feller Kopman. Do you have anything to add to that question? Um, not so much to that question, but I, I do want to echo what Dr. Muhammad was saying about small biopsy specimens. So as, as the pulmonologist, you, you know, we are often the ones obtaining tissue. Um, as everybody knows, about 65% of patients with lung cancer present with advanced stage disease. So uh, we're being, or the pathologists are clearly being asked to do more and more testing with smaller and smaller tissue from um, small biopsy specimens. And there was a very nice paper by Roy Chowdhury outlining um, the recommendations for testing on small biopsy specimens. And clearly, although many oncology trials um, state that they need a quote unquote core, uh, as pulmonologists, we don't have core needles. And, and the Roy Ch Chowdhury uh, multidisciplinary guidelines actually recommend that all of these tests can be obtained with uh, 19, 21, or 22 gauge needles. The key is selecting the tissue for appropriate testing and not wasting tissue 
Um, so there needs to be really great communication between the oncologist, the pulmonologist, and the pathologist slash pathology lab and how that tissue is going to get prioritized. I would say the key is also has to do with the adequacy of the cells and the cell block that's prepared on this pathology specimen. Uh, Dr. Malka, any, any thoughts on, from your end? Well, I, I would just add, so one way that we could increase that is to have rows in the room. So happy, having rapid onsite evaluation um, clearly has been shown to increase cellularity because as everybody knows, the tumor is not distributed homogeneously through a lymph node. So if I'm biopsying over here and they say I have good lymphocytes, but over here is all tumor, that's where I'm going to focus my uh, TBNA. Uh, I agree. I think that's uh, helpful. Uh, we also try to work with our pathology group to divide the samples so it will not be all, uh, all exhausted for the uh, immunohistochemical stains and just to divide it for part to go to molecular and part to go for immunohistochemical stains so it will not be exhausted in one panel and not the other. You know, it, the more I hear about it, the more it comes back to really good communication in almost every patient circumstance. I don't think there's there's a, a one size fits all, but I think that uh, if we work closely together in these situations, better outcomes for patients and then numbers go up, we don't have to go back and repeat. Uh, bad communication or no communication leads to sort of a blind needling or, or a, a less uh, a tissue that, that is adequate and then demands for additional tissue, which may or may not be available because of the patient's status. Uh, so, but of course, communication takes time uh, and it has it requires developing relationships that uh, uh, also require time. And so there's, there's gonna have to be a, 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 a sort of stakeholder championing of this, I think, uh, for success. Just echoing the importance of roles and also the communication between pathologists, pulmonologists, it's very important when we go to roles, um, when the pulmonologist knows that this is the right spot, we get a lot of good material, then definitely are willing to give us more material, sometimes just more dedicated passes, especially when you are thinking about this might be, you know, a non-small cell lung cancer. They're always willing to give us more material, but we are the one that we should initiate or cytotechnologist um, to say, you know what, this is a good spot, we need more material. and. With cell block, there are several studies showing that actually it's been very successful in molecular studies. And I had the privilege of uh, working with Dr. Malecki at oh. Hopkins. So, uh, you know, it's just a real privilege and pleasure when the pathologists and the pulmonologists work so closely together. So um, I would just encourage everybody in the audience to develop those relationships. It's really a win-win both for uh, pathology, pulmonary, and most importantly, the patient. Same here, David. We miss you. Yeah. You know, Dr. Dr. Malecki mentioned our techs, our cytotechnologists who are so in, engaged. Uh, I've talked to colleagues who have had trouble recruiting because uh, they, they, don't, they don't fall out of the sky. They're not uh, as, as common as we need to be. So any uh, thoughts or any comments or suggestions on what to do when you've got folks maybe more in community, but maybe smaller academic centers for which having uh, a recruitment of cytotechs is problematic. How do you get around that when you need them in so many of these uh, 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 patient uh, encounters? I think the role of cytotechnologists in general um, is expanding. They are doing more and more. And I think the schools of um, cytotechnologists, some of them actually, they were close, closed very prematurely. I think Maybe it's time for us to revisit our needs to cytotechnologists. And as uh, Dr. Kaufman mentioned, I mean, we had the privilege to work with David for many, many years. And um, it's we, we, about the system that we had, we had our cytotechnologists going for roles and that type of, you know, line of communication um, between pulmonologists like Dr. Kaufman and cytotechnologists um, definitely that improved our, you know, specimen adequacy.
Um, one suggestion also, uh, which we do have here in uh, Greensboro, and I think in many other places, is the multidisciplinary uh, tumor board, which is we, we do have it weekly. And we are not just discussing cases that already have a diagnosis. We actually discuss a lot of cases that they don't have a diagnosis, that they're going to go and have a diagnosis. And having everyone on board, the pathologist, the radiologist, I mean, uh, you know, pulmonologist, thoracic surgeon, or everyone is sitting in the, in the room or on uh, currently on WebEx. Uh, uh, but we were able to, um, you know, make decisions and uh, recommendation. What lesion are we going to go after? How much do we need? Does this look like small cell or this is likely to be uh, adenocarcinoma or this likely to be a squamous cell carcinoma? So definitely lesions that are suspicious to be adenocarcinoma. We always like to get more uh, for testing. Um, so these recommendations are done before the patient gets the biopsy. And uh, whenever the, whoever is going to do the biopsy really knows um, what, what we need. And the pathologist, uh, who probably doesn't have anything to do at the beginning, uh, they are in the receiving end, actually, they're also paying attention uh, to what's going on in the case, what the uh, imaging look like, and what to expect to have uh, when they have a specimen come. Just a few words that in um, um, echoing what Dr. Mohammed you mentioned about those multidisciplinary um, tumor boards, even prior to any type of uh, diagnostic procedure. It happened to us, actually, we had a case um, um, here that uh, it's not uncommon that we see metastatic lesions in the lung. It can be actually uh, present as a solitary mass that um, it might be misleading for lung adenocarcinoma. And the, specifically, I would like to emphasize on papillary thyroid carcinoma metastatic to, to the lung, that TTF1 is positive. Um, you have beautiful papillary configurations. It looks like maybe just a very low grade adenocarcinoma. And Subsequent follow-up shows that actually patient has a thyroid mass as well. So um, it's very important that if there is any clinical suspicion, we should do additional staining, make sure that it's not a metastatic process. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. You know, we, we, we use these webinars and meetings to sometimes focus very, very carefully on a certain subject, but let's not make sure we have blinders on. Uh, you mentioned, you know, thyroid. I looked at a uh, single solitary uh, uh, lung nodule this morning, which was melanoma in a patient without a history until I dug back and finally found someone who said, yeah, he had a melanoma six years ago on a scalp. Uh, I would have liked to have had that before the slide showed up. So again, communication from our clinical colleagues who are in the best position to know the histories of our patients can help us uh, uh, steer clear because I know uh, Dr. Malecki and I both know melanoma is a great mimicker of many things, uh, and a single lung nodule looking all the world like lung cancer uh, uh, make needs needs for our pathologists to take the blinders off and think of all possibilities, including metastases uh, and benign lesions uh, that may occur, uh, so that we don't overcall uh, these lesions that are, are misdiagnosed and that are met that may pop up, uh, and. And all that needs to be done, again, by only utilizing the tissue necessary because we have to do more immune stains to try to work up a case. That's less biomarker immune stain tissue that may be available. Um, and so, again, treating the tissue is precious, uh, as our standard, uh, I think, is, is the only way to go. We do have a question from Farah. She provide, he or she provided thanks for the presentation, but asked who is supposed to start ordering, ordering molecular testing, and most of the time it can be late if a patient waits to see the oncologist. Well, this gets back to the potential of reflex testing. And I'm very interested in knowing what the team here uh, on, on this panel uh, thinks of it and does. 
uh, in their institutions. So, uh, Dr. Mahali, do you want to kick start it, sir? Uh, absolutely. Um, I am really very advocate for uh, reflex testing. Uh, the only uh, pushback that I had in the past, and probably you guys know that, that there was no indication to do testing for stage one and two. Uh, maybe stage three and four, yes. And the pathologists, by the time they receive the specimen, they don't know what stage the patient had. They just have specimen. So uh, that was delaying us really from doing reflex testing on this patient. Now, as we see more of this um, mutation and uh, adjuvant treatment coming er to earlier stage, I'm hoping that everyone gonna be uh, having reflex testing uh, and we don't have to really order it. I was lucky because I'm still lucky that we, we have a navigator, Dana is on, online, um, and we also have a group that we meet every week. So uh, we, we order uh, the uh, molecular study on the, on the conference. We, we don't have to wait until I see the patient. So by the time I'm seeing the patient a week later, uh, it's already one week it's gone from from that uh, uh, order date so uh, so by the time I'm seeing them even if there is delay it's it's only another week or a few more days to to get the result I'm also lucky that our uh, group uh, are very well uh, educated and knows exactly what need to be ordered so you'll be surprised there were a lot of thoracic surgeon a lot of the pulmonologists already ordered the test the moment they got the report that it's adenocarcinoma or it's even uh, squamous, they order the test that I need to, to order because they know what I need because they are always there on the conference and they hear it over and over again. Oh, adenocarcinoma, let's order this. Yes, squamous, I need to order that. So most of them really are very familiar with what we need to order. So they don't waste time in ordering it. Um, so by the time I see the patient as a medical oncologist, I'm already, uh, most of the time, it's only a few more days before I get the result if it's not there. Uh, there are two comments from the audience. Any further comment from the panelists before addressing the audience statements? Please uh, bring on the audience's concerns and statements. I want to go with the episode. <laughs> Uh, from Cl Clarissa Moholik, we have a chat message that our pathologists are only wanting medical oncologists to order these tests. We are in the process of discussing all of these issues to develop a better communication strategy, strategy algorithm, pathway, et cetera. Well, uh, not knowing exactly what practice setting, I would say that uh, that is wise to try to put that all together. Uh, I don't care who orders the tests. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an ego trip or anything or a turf battle. This is getting care to our patient as quickly and, and appropriately as possible. In that setting, I'm a big fan of reflex tests because I'm making the call. This is adenocarcinoma. Uh, so I'm sitting here, go to the EMR, order the test, one and done, versus report goes back to the oncologist who then gets to it later. Uh, decides what she or he wants on this patient versus uh, a standardized uh, uh, understanding, which we need. So my hat's off uh, to the team for, for getting the pathologist engaged with the other folks. And it may be pathologists don't want to, it may just be so burdensome for communication that it's just easier to default to what the oncologist wants, but it doesn't standardize it. It doesn't uh, make it timely. So uh, uh, I very much encourage uh, the team to do what they're doing and, and, uh, and document the successes and, and show the improvements. Yes, we Dr. all Cotton, did... what, what are your thoughts, sir, sir on, on uh, that query? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think I think reflex testing is by far and away the way to go. And that's something that we had at Hopkins. Um, I just started as a chief of pulmonary at Dartmouth, so I have to figure out what the process is here. Um, but by far and away, it's, it's easiest and quickest. And the, the quick is important because it used to be at, at Hopkins that our medical oncologists wouldn't even treat a patient uh, without a diagnosis, but now they can't treat a patient until the markers come back. So it, it's really crucial in starting prompt therapy. And when you and when you think about it from the patient's perspective, you know they're coming in with a cough to their primary care doctor. The 
primary care doctor puts him on antibiotics for a week, it doesn't go away, calls the pulmonologist, the pulmonologist sees him, orders a CAT scan, says, oh, you got a mask, we're gonna schedule you for the bronchoscopy. The bronchoscopy happens several days later. And then to delay this by another two weeks waiting for these markers uh, really delays treatment. So I, I'm a big fan of reflex testing here. Yes, we, we actually here at Hopkins pathologists order molecular testing, and that would be immediately after finalizing the diagnosis. So patient comes with the, with the, for the procedure, we look at the matter, give a diagnosis. Immediately when we release the diagnosis, we order NGS and pd one for all cases of non-small cell lung cancers regardless. And if, and in addition, um, a practical point to our you know, colleagues, especially in community hospitals, we found it actually very helpful that uh, when we are putting in our report that which block or which core biopsy, whatever we have, which one has actually the highest amount of diagnostic material. And um, in cases that there is insufficient material, then our pulmonologists would see the report immediately. So they, then next step, they, David, you can tell us, you know, what you do, you know, when you see an insufficient case and for molecular studies. Can, I, I lost you at the end. Can I tell us what we do and what? Yeah, you see a report that it says the specimen is insufficient for molecular studies, but we give a yeah. diagnosis. So then what do you do? Well, I, I think the key there is to know what your quantity and sufficient rate is. And the only way to do that is to audit yourself because everybody thinks they're wonderful. You know, I, I do the case and patient leaves the room and unless I, you know, see review my pathology, see what my QNS rate is, I don't know. And then you can't do all the systems things to improve that number. Um, you know, ideally your QNS rate should be low in, in the single digits. Um, and, and if not, then you got to try and work with your pathologists and the cytotechs in the room um, about specimen processing and handling. And um, maybe you need to do more dedicated passes just for moleculars. So you really need to be a little introspective and honest with yourself. And that, and that conversation needs to be done in a sort of a no shame, no blame method. Absolutely. Not trying to point fingers. We're trying to improve everyone's uh, Q&S uh, rates uh, and, uh, and work as a, as in a collegial manner to do it. Now, I noticed there's another, co another comment or question uh, are patients consented up front before biopsy, uh, before biopsy about molecular testing? I was looking at that and pondering it. Uh, I'll kickstart this, uh, but I'm interested in hearing what you have to say, because for me, the consent for the uh, testing probably is rolled into the consent for the biopsy, and I'll, I'll come, that all comes down to the front end of the patients being admitted. Uh, but because molecular testing is expensive, uh, and uh, insurance may or may not, you know, do the trick. I think there may be important uh, communication that needs to be had around the potential for the patient to be hit with an unexpected bill. You know, that's a hot topic in my world. Uh, please share your thoughts. I'm going to ask Dr. Malecki to kick that one off. What do you think, Dr. Malecki? That, that, that's a good point. I mean, in terms of, uh, sorry, can you just Tell me, I lost the last sentence that you said. I'm sorry about that. Well, that's, I, look, I think that we probably have legal consent for molecular testing as part of our overall consent for our that patient. Yes. Uh, but because testing can be expensive and I don't want my patient to be saddled with a big bill if they don't know about it, uh, and then these unexpected bills pop up, uh, I think there's got to be some discussion, some conversation. Uh, what is your perspective on that? And it probably has something to do with paramix. Uh, share your thoughts in terms of uh, discussing uh, payment with the uh, with the patient, uh, costs with the patient, things like that. Yeah, that that's actually that's very important for for the um, uh, part of uh, patient care. I checked with our um, billing office in terms of this molecular testing for um, lung cancer, and what I was told that actually it says most payers require prior authorization. So that, um, I think probably that comes from the clinician that um, probably patients, uh, 
I don't know. I think Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Kaufman may comment on that, that um, patient may not necessarily be able to ask for different type of molecular testing uh, specifically, or we, we need some sort of uh, their authorization um, in terms of cost, but in terms of NGS and PDL1, we, we order it routinely. I haven't experienced any problems. Yeah, honestly, you know, I've been doing this a long time. That's the first time I've been asked about consent for this. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this is the standard of care. Uh, so it's it's part of the procedure. This is what we need to do to treat you. Um, you know, and then if there are insurance issues, I, I guess. I, I would be surprised if any patient uh, uh, decline uh, to have the test uh, done because that's really means a lot for them and they would like it to be done as soon as possible. Uh, the other thing really is the, um, most of the med Medicare and insurance currently are, this is the standard of care, so they are really covering it uh, with no issues. In the past, it used to be an issue because we, in the past, we used to have only EGFR and L. Everything else was um, still experimental. And uh, I, I remember several years ago, I have a patient who I tested with NGS and came back positive for EGFR mutation, but the report included BRAF and included all the other uh, testing because that's part of the of the panel. And uh, the insurance uh, actually denied the BRAF test as part of the whole thing. They they then they forgot about the EGFR that is positive. They forgot about everything and said, oh, "Why are you testing for BRAF? It's actually part of the panel." But they tried to charge the patient for that uh, BRAF mutation test that was on the panel. Uh, so, but this is not the case these days, but yes, several years ago it was. I think it's very important with the, what I found that MCCN guidelines and College of American Pathologies recommendations, I think those are really in support of uh, patient care, support of our clinicians, our oncologists, because when they, when they run um, huge surveys and studies and when they endorse recommendations, then when it comes to insurance companies, I think they, they consider that one as a standard of care versus some um, rare um, molecular alterations that it might be just in a particular lab in the country that patient requests. So I think um, it, MCCN and, and also CAP might have huge impact on, you know, patient uh, support in terms of receiving adequate treatment in general. Crystal Anstad added that they are performing consents due to GINA in the event of incidentally germline, incidental germline findings are reported out. I'm really interested in seeing what the team has to say about this. I had not considered that. Um, I think if we use limited panels, we could probably eliminate that concern. I'm also concerned that requiring cons independent consent for this is just one more thing to slow the train down in an already very, sometimes very slow process. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, what are your thoughts, sir, please? Um, this has not been an issue for uh, for us uh, so far, but uh, whenever we see a germline mutation or something that concerning, we send them to the genetic counseling for additional workup, but uh, it has not been an issue for us. Dr. Kotman, any thoughts in your regard? Um, I don't have anything further to add. Um, Dr. Malecki, have you run across this? No, never. We haven't been experiencing any difficult any problems with that. I wonder if, if I'm sorry, that concern I think it stands for any type of you know biopsies. One can claim that even maybe just you know skin biopsy, just tissue biopsy might be a subject of DNA extraction or you know, I think that's you know that can be, you know you know, expand it to any type of, you know, tissue, so. I think you're absolutely right. I think this, this might, it's not the, uh, this is not the conversation for it, but I think there's a uh, medical humanities or medical ethics question here that yes. probably could use a little, uh, a little broader discussion in another forum. 
Michelle, any more questions for the team? Uh, there's another statement that in tumor only testing, a mutation is not definitely known to be somatic or germline. Uh, we also have about six more minutes. Uh, of course, if the audience has any more questions to submit through Q&A or chat, but I'd like to throw out a round robin for the panelists to provide any uh, highlight or uh, specific insights on branching. Even I'm in a community setting, we uh, are really lucky to have established the programs that really working for our patient um, on all level. And I wish uh, that it's available in many other uh, places. Uh, you know, having a, a navigator uh, is very, very important to uh, make any program successful because uh, that's really the link between all of us. So all of us are busy, but, uh, you know, a navigator would, you know, uh, coordinate care uh, for our patient among all of us. Uh, that's important. Uh, communication is very important. Uh, and uh, as we meet as one group every week, and uh, sometimes we even go to uh, dinner once a month uh, as an oncology, um, thoracic oncology uh, working group uh, to discuss future uh, plans and also what's good, what's bad, and what we, how we can improve. That's really uh, bring us closer together uh, rather than everyone in their field and they don't know what the other person is doing. So I would encourage everyone really, if they have the ability to establish something like this, not in just lung cancer, which is uh, important because it's really complicated in the care, taking care of it, but in every other branch uh, of um, or uh, specialty of the uh, oncology. Yeah, I would agree. I think the, the two takeaways for any conference on lung cancer is that you really need a multidisciplinary conference um, and you need to have broad open lines of communication. Yeah, I think communication is extremely important. Uh, if I want to uh, um, share with my personal experience, I think um, Clinical history is extremely important when it comes to tissue preservation, and that comes out of our communication. And also uh, for those pathologists who are early in their practice, interpretation of IHC can be very risky. So make sure that your, uh, all your controls work very well and the interpretation of IHC is uh, very correct and not to be trapped with the panel of IHC stains that you use. I would say that uh, it's, it's, it's webinars like this that help move the ball forward. Uh, you know, spending the time, and it takes time, but spending the time uh, discussing amongst ourselves, learning from each other, seeing where we're all on the same page uh, gives me uh, uh, a sense that I'm, you know, in some respects feeling pretty isolated, doing the right thing. Uh, I'm on par with my colleagues who are superior colleagues. Uh, I think that helps us all uh, uh, move forward and, and for better patient care because I do look at the whole lung cancer uh, biomarker landscape and I see uh, uh, disparity problems, equity problems uh, that I think uh, need to be addressed. As has been said several times, this is standard of care and has been standard of care for some time. And I, I struggle with, the, with it not being as standard of care as an HD slide uh, sometimes, but this is a lot of moving parts a lot of complications, but these sessions like this, I think help, help us all move forward. So thank you very much for uh, having this for all of us. Thank you all. Is we have time for one last question or one last round of comments? One thing that was clear to me in our discussion is the nurse navigators and our techs in the laboratory play such a central role that this would would disintegrate without their uh, involvement and their expertise. So I think, frankly, a, a hats off to them. They're sometimes not necessarily seen as the as the go to people uh, first thought of, but in fact they are the the, the secret of success. And I think we need to honor them uh, uh, for what they did. Thank you. 